Um, I'm going to make a start. Um, I want to just keep us on time. So we'll have a 6.30 start and as attendees um, join, we'll um, get everyone to keep up to date in the chat. But also this session is being recorded so you can um, watch back um, in your own time as well. So I'd like to start by introducing myself. My name is Sarah Lorimer. I am the Sexual and Reproductive Health Team Leader at Gen West. And joining me um, tonight is Tilly Marnie, who's the Sexual and Reproductive Health Coordinator at Women's Health in the North. And we also have our speakers for tonight, which are Intasar and Shakriya. I'll let them introduce themselves in a moment as they present. Um, and then also joining us later on for the Q&A is um, Dr. Joanne Gardner. So I'm going to run through some housekeeping, but I do want to begin with an acknowledgement. So Gen West and Women's Health in the North recognise that the land on which we work and provide our services always was and always will be Aboriginal land. We pay respects to Elders past and present and to any community members here today. We'd also like to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities across Melbourne's Northwest, their rich cultures, diversity, history and knowledges, and the deep contribution they make to the life of this region. So I will just explain briefly who Gen West and Women's Health in the North are. So we're both organisations working towards gender equity. Key aspect of our work is sexual and reproductive health. And that includes providing health education to communities in the Northwest region and advocating for sexual and reproductive health and rights. We work in partnership with women's health services across the state, as well as partners from community health, local government and health services. And just a bit of housekeeping for this evening. So with the setup of Zoom tonight, all attendees are muted. If you would like to contribute to the conversation or if you have any questions, um, please put them into the Q&A box. We will have a Q&A session following the presentations this evening and there will be 30 minutes for that. So there's plenty of time um, to have your questions answered. And again, just a reminder that this session is being recorded. Um, if you would like to um, remain um, anonymous, you can um, turn your cameras off, um, but it is important that you do have your name present so that the PHN is able to um, confirm your attendance. We will need to confirm with Olivia from the PHN um, your name to receive the CPD points and attendance certificate. All right, so I'm now going to just do a quick overview of the evening. We're going to do part one, which will be um, an introduction to female genital cutting. And then we'll move into part two, um, which will be an overview of the Family and Reproductive Rights Education Program. And um, Shakri will be going through how best um, to provide culturally sensitive support around FGC. And then in part three, we're going to go through some case studies and there'll also be time for a Q&A discussion. All right, I will now pass over to Intasa. Um, Intasa, you can introduce your role and then um, start the first part of the presentation. Um, good evening. Thank you so much, Sarah, for the introduction. Um, my name is Intasar. I work at WIN as um, health promotion officer at the FARA program, which is we are going to talk about it later. Uh, before I start my talk, I would like also to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today. Um, I pay my respect to um, all those past and present, and in my um, area is the Wurundjeri Kulu Nations. And yeah, so we can start the presentation. Um, so the global data of FGC, I'm just gonna go there. Um, the names of this, and I've got it in my way. So we've got, um, at the beginning, I'm gonna talk about the global data um, of FGC around the world. So 140 million women and girls worldwide undergo um, some forms of FGC. 
3 million at risk of undergoing the practice each year. 29 countries practice in parts of Africa, Asia, and Middle East. And 109,000 people living in Australia um, from countries known as practice FDC. And that comes from, um, it's, this data was like um, collected in 2011, and we got it from Family Plan in Victoria. Thank you. If we go to the next slide. Um, the definition of um, female genital cutting is all procedures that includes part of a total removal of the female genital organs or other injuries to female genital organs uh, for non-medical reasons. So um, it's happened for non-medical reasons. There's, um, there's no benefit out of it, but it's, it's a traditional um, custom that um, we do as a community. So this is a question for discussion, which is you can put your answers into the chat and then Sarah can read a few of them now or later. Um, so what do you know about FGC? Or what have you heard about the history of the practice? As you um, professionals, Um, just give you like a minute and then we go to the next slide. Hey. So yeah, there's I understand the different types and why this practice globally. Great. Um, that was from the chat. Um, so the history came from um in the time of the Memes of Egypt back to the 16th century, also in the Roman times, from uh, forms of infibulation were used on female um slaves as a form of contraception. Um, United States, it was like FGC was practiced by doctors to cure female weakness. Um, the Western countries, including England, have used FGC to cure women for psychological elements and so-called female dividends um, at the time. Yep, you want to go to the next slide? Thank you so much, Billy. Um, so another question for discussion. Uh, do you know at what age the practice is um, carried out? Well, not so. Okay. Go to the next uh, slide, please. So um, the procedure might carry out when the girl is newborn, which is as young as six weeks. Um, during childhood, adolescence, um, just before marriage. Um, and I think this happened in Kenya. Um, during first pregnancy, um, however, the majority of cases of FGC are sought to take place between age of five um, and eight, like between five and eight. Thank you so much, Tilly. Terminology. This is very important as husband professionals working with women's um experienced FGC. So do you want to guess or you know probably which one we can use when we're working with women or engaged with communities? Female circumcision, female genital mutilation, or traditional cutting? Which one do you think? Um be using as house professionals working with communities. One or three, depending on yep, right in that situation. Yep. Um right answer. So we can use yep um female genital um 
use of the word mutilation, it's reinforced the harm caused by the practice. Um, retreats that it is gender-based human rights violation. The terms such as female circumcision or traditional cutting are more effective in engaging um, families and communities. Terminology is very important as the terms mutilation can pluralize communities where the practice is a cultural custom. Because um, people don't feel mutilated. Yes, it's a bad traditional. We need to ban, but um, as a woman that's circumcised, we don't feel mutilated. So the word mutilated, um, it gets, um, make us feel not great. Thank you so much, Tilly. We can go to the next slide. So um, the next slide that's coming up is a bit of trigger warning for coming slides. So it could be like sensitive or Feel free to leave the webinar if you feel it is so sensitive. Um, so the um, FQC, according to the World Health Organization, um, classified into four classes, type one, type two, and type three. So type one is the, uh, is the part of or total removal of the clitoris. Um, other terms used um, describe type one procedures include circumcision, Realistics and circumcision sunna. So they say it is sunna, but it's not sunna because what sunna is, whatever Prophet Muhammad used to do, like the way he eat, the way he um you know doing things every day, because he was doing healthy stuff, healthy eating, healthy exercise. So that's what sunna is. So when we follow that, that's the sunna. But Prophet Muhammad has five girls never circumcised them. None of them are circumcised. So I don't know what they call it still now, but it's not, it doesn't seem similar to me. Thank you so much. Um, type two is part of the total removal of the clitoris and the libia menorah, including part of the total exclusion of the libia menorah. And then this is the next one is, this is the worst type, the severe type, that's removal part or, or um, all of the external genitalia and the stitch and narrowing the vagina opening. So they call it infibulations, um, leaving in small hole for urine and menstrual flow. Other terms used um, to describe type three uh, procedure including chronic circumcision because the pharaoh used to um, stitch their wives I think when they go to um, to trip or when they go away for a few months they used to stitch their um, wives mm -hmm. um, type 4 is anything that you do with the um, vagina so pre-cam, pre missing of, you know, the clitoris, whatever you do. Stretching, you know, all the stuff that you do with your clitoris, it um, seems uh, deems as type four. Um, okay, Italy, we have the next one. When we come to implication of FGC, it, type one and type two and four, there's not much of um, implication, but um, the type one and two, they decrease the sexual enjoyment, as you see. Um, when we come to type three, and that's the worst type and severe types, look, at all boxes are full, like sex is decreased sexual enjoyment, painful, difficult penetration, potential needs for non you could be infibulation, um, when we come to menstrual um, menstruation, is decreased urinary and menstrual um, flow, painful period, increased risk of um, urinary tract infection. When we come to hygiene, accumulation of urine and menstrual blood, increased risk of urinary um, tract infection and vaginal infection, urinary um, and fetal um, um, incontinence as well. 
when we come to press, need um, for the infibulation. Um, the infibulation give press, so it might take longer to um, get press, pre long labor, yeah. Increased risk, um, fetal and menstrual majority and mortality. And then type four, it doesn't have that much implication. Health impact, we have um, a long term and short term. So the short term um, health effect is excessive bleeding, wound infection, um, urinary retention, infection, hemorrhage, and can potentially lead to death. And that's also because back home, it will happen in the backyard. So there is no anesthesia, there's no anesthetic, nothing. So all the stuff, it might lead to death at the time or like that as well, um, if there's hemorrhage. Um, the long term is painful administration. Um, chronic pelvic infection, reproductive tract infection, complications during pregnancy and child breast and infert infertility, especially with type three. Thank you. When we come to privilege, um, it's, the, it's heavily used in Horn of Africa, as you see here the map. So it's the Horn of Africa. So the darkest color is the highest prevalence. So we've got Egypt, and that was in, when was that? Tokyo, is that 2015? I think that was 2017, the map. So I'm um, collected by UNICEF. Um, so Egypt, it was still in 91%. Sudan, 88%, um, Ethiopia, 74%, Somalia, 98%. So Ethiopia, Somalia, Sudan, they might um, practice the um, type three circumcision. Um, I'm gonna go to the next slide. Oh, wow. So look at this one. That was also 2017 collected by UNICEF. Um, this is the percentage of girls and women aged 15 to 49 who have heard about FGC and think the practice should end. So we have a long way to go. So we've got um, Kenya is 21%, um, Sri Leone 23%. Um, so we still have a long way to go. So the people think still um, need to practice FGC, but hopefully it will be type one and two. Thank you so much. This is the percentage of girls aged 15 to 19 who have undergone FGC. And that goes by, um, you know, going decreasing by the year. So starting 1995 to today as 2015, because that was the latest resource to get. Um, 2010. So no, no, I got the things in 2015. The actually collection of the data was 2015, but that was um, today as 2015. So it's, it is decreasing a little bit, but we still have a long way to work as well. Um, you can see like it's coming down by little in five years. Thank you. Another question for discussion, which is, um, do you know what the prevalence rate of FGC is in Victoria? Probably we just go to the answer. So it's very hard to know like how many. It's difficult to estimate because we have not no data, and you know how hard it is to collect data on those kind of things. Needs a lot of money and capacity. 
Um, however, there is a high settlement of the women and girls for countries um, where FTC is prevalent. Next slide. Um, so this is the estimate, um, President. So um, it's it's a lot, as you see. The graph here from ninety eight to two thousand seventeen. So it's rising. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so those are um people who are settling. Um, that women from countries um with high FTC prevalence, right in Victoria. So as we see here, the Northwest, um, there's um huge um uh, women that experience FGC or come from countries that practice FGC. There's a huge settling um in the Northwest. If you see like Pembank, um, Moland, we do see um yep, so here have the high as well. Yep, thank you. Go to the next one. Do you know what people um reasons are get FGC? Why we um practice FGC as a communities of countries? Um if you would just want to go to the answer please. Okay. So it's uh it's a traditional practice, it's cultural identity. So it's been happened so long ago. So when like, you know, um, so people using it just because it's traditional practice and it's been happening, it's inherited from our grand, grand, grandparents. It's the hygiene and clean. So they think um, clitoris is um, dirty. So um, need to cut it because we want to clean the woman. Um, it's just a myth, you know, that um, people um, practice FTC. It's not for a medical reason. Uh, protection of virginity, so they want to um, reduce the girls sexually active. So um, they said, okay, because clitoris is a desire kind of organ, so we need to cut it just for the girls to be less sexually active. Um, to ensure fidelity to promote marriageability and social and economic status. So um, in some um, communities or countries, they will circumcise the girls when she's like 15, 16. So um, what they tell into the community is like, our girls is ready for marriage. It's ready to ask for her hand, you know, so they will let, it's like, um, like she's a growing up woman now, she can get married. Um, to enhance um, the husband's sexual pleasure, um, religious observance, what we said, I told you before, is not a religion at all. So it's not even the Torah, and it's predated as well. Um, Christianity predated Islam and Jews, Judaism. So it's nothing to do with religion, but people will say it is religion. Um, social pressure from fear, so that's because um, people. Um, think that um, my friend get um, circumcised, I need to get circumcised. And also pressure from the community. Because um, um, one of my friends was um, talking about how, how how she get ended with circumcision because she went to the mosque and then the older woman asked them if they are circumcised and then um, she said, no, I'm not circumcised. The older woman asked the young girls if they are circumcised. Then one of them said, no. Then she said, you have to go back home because you're not clean. You cannot come to the um, the mosque. So they, they make it interesting. They make it, you'll be excluded from your community. So probably you wanna, it want to happen to you. So you can go and ask for it as well. They make it interesting as well. They make a big party for you. Um, Hina, they give you money, they give a lot of um, gifts at the time of circumcision. 
Um, um, yep. So that's what um the reason that we use um synthesizing as community, but hopefully not a lot of people using it those days. Um, do you think um religion um descriptors um advocate or justify the practice of FGC? So I think I talked about this as well. So if you want to go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, FGC, as I said, um, practiced by communities and often claimed to be carried out um, um, according to religion beliefs. However, FGC predated Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. The Bible or Quran, Torah, and other religious texts do not advocate or justify this. Mm -hmm. Another um, discussion question. Where do you think the procedure of FDC carried out? Who do you think carried out the um, FDC? Anyone else? Yeah, I'll just go to the next one. So it's usually carried out by an old woman for whom it is a way of gaining a prestige and can be source of its income as well. Um, it is also carried out in hospital type one, and that's happened in, Mal in Indonesia, or Malaysia, Malaysia, because the argument is people are doing it anyway at the backyard. So it's better to do it at the hospital in the medical settings, who's anesthetic and clean and hygiene and stuff, uh, but only type one though. Uh, the procedure includes the girls being held on the floor, usually by a lot of women, and the procedure carried out without medical exhibitive attention to hygiene or anesthesia. Okay. Human rights framework. So FGC, also the UNICEF, um, um, doing a lot of work with um, countries that um, experience FGC or practice FGC. So um, FGC constitution is a violation of the rights of women and girls. FGC viol violates a number of treaties um, covenant on civil and political rights, covenant on economic, social and cultural rights, convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, um, convention on the um, rights of the child, convention um, relate, relating to the status of refugee and its protocol relating um, to the status of refugees. World Health Organization. Uh, effect to eradicate FGC, international response, Australian response. So there is, uh, so we are going to talk about this, but so there is um, around 10 fire workers in Victoria, which is um, they are women health and hospitals and councils. International status of FGC, it's illegal in Europe, um, North Africa, New Zealand, Australia, illegal in part of Africa, even if like, you know, I think a lot of country in Africa is um, illegal, but it's not enforcement. You know, just, there's no enforcement, like no penalty, nothing. No one will come and ask if he does it. Like, and they do it in big parties and big celebrations, but it's not an enforcement law. Um, issues with enforcement, so legislation, um, medicalized in some countries as part of harm reduction strategy. International response. So, as I said, UN and UNICEF working um, um, with countries as well. UN General Embassy accepted in December 2012 resolution to eliminate FPC. The World Health Organization 
published global, excuse me, global strategies to stop healthcare providers from perform, performing at DC in 2010. Research shows um, decrease in privilege of FDC as increased number of women and men support ending of the practice. Is that next slide? I'm going to keep it clear. Do you know what the legal status of FDC in Victoria? I think we just go to the next slide. Legal status of FDC in Victoria. So the previous um, Victorian legislation, um, crimes, female genital mutilation act 1996, um, legal status of FDC, um, also fell under children use Families Act 2005 and its mandatory reporting for people that were with children. So, um, yeah, we need to record it if you come across. So, part two. So, I'm going to um, pass on to Sequoia. Thank you so much. And have a good night. I'll be here when Sequoia doing her part. And I'll be here for the Q&A as well. Thank you so much. Thank you for that, Intasa. Um, but I would like to begin um, with acknowledgement first. So I would like to, to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. And I would also like to pay my respect to the elders past and present. Um, so my name is Shukriya. Um, I'm one of the FARAP coordinators, health, um, health promotion coordinators at Gen West. Um, I am, so we, I'm one of the FARAP workers at Gen West. We, we do have other, another FARAP worker who works with young, young women, um, in the community, um, providing sexual and reproductive health, um, programs and sessions for, for women in the community. Um, my role is, I'm one of, so my role is that I provide professional development training, to um, practitioners um, such as yourself, um, service providers around how to best, I guess, support women in the community and what are and, and be able to give them some stepping tools on how to do that. Um, so I'm yeah, I'm going to go through um, the second part of the 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 program and but, Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll begin. Um. So, what what's FARAP? So, FARAP stands for the Family and Reproductive Right Education Program. Um. It was established in 1995. Um. It's a statewide program. It's only a pro. It's it's a program that's uh, only in Victoria. Um. It's funded by DHHS, uh, Department of Human um Department of Health and Human Services. Um. The aim of the program is to um. To prevent FGC and it, and readdress the sexual and reproductive health issues um, in, in the communities impacted by the the practice, and it is uh, based on the UN initiative um, to eradicate female genital cutting. Um, so Farab at Gen West. Um, sits within the Action for Equity team, which is a sexual and reproductive health um, strategy for Melbourne's West. It works with a um, range of health professionals, um, uh, such as yourself, to build, to build a capacity and ensure provision of culturally appropriate services in Melbourne's West um, and improves the sexual and reproductive health and well-being um, of women from communities who have migrated from FGC prevalence and, and hopefully in work to prevent the practice from taking or happening or taking place. Um, Farab at uh, Women's Health in the North uh, sits within the freedom, respect and e equity in sexual health, which is sexual reproductive health strategy 
for Melbourne uh, for Melbourne's North um, delivers FGC um, professional education session to clinicians and allied health staff focusing on cultural sensitive services um, provision works with women communities at that traditionally practice female genital cutting um, to support their sexual and reproductive health and work to prevent the practice. Working with communities. So my focus will be um, how to best support the community. Next slide. Um, so I want to understand a little bit of what what you all know about what those settlement issues are. So do you think, do you know the implication of um, settlement in communities, um, whether they're from refugee or migrant communities? What are the what are the implications that you've heard or you've seen? Um, so these are just some of the um, some of that I we thought of. Um, so I can start with um, grief, settlement issues, language barriers, um, cultural shock, legal status of female genital cutting, not knowing whether it's legal, or illegal, um, and what's happening around FGC, um, intergenerational conflict, um, different gender roles, expectations. Um, um, health literacy, um, experiences of racism and discrimination, um, finding it really hard to navigate the health system in, 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 in Australia. What do you think are the health needs of women and girls from FGC pre prevalence communities? Um, so, yeah, health needs of women and girls are education, counselling, um, regular gynaecological checkups, intensive antenatal and prenatal care or postnatal care, um, with, like having access to the doing fibrillation clinic, um, menopausal care. There's a lot, um, but these are just some of the things that I've come across. Why is it important to work with women and girls? Um, it's really important that we meet the, and assist uh, in meeting the sexual and reproductive health needs of women and girls who have migrated from those communities um, in hoping to prevent FGC from occurring, um, in, improving the health um, outcomes, improving access to services. Um, traditional African community roles. Um, so the, one of the reasons um, we're, we're focusing, I guess, on the African communities is, as, as I said before, there is around 28 countries just in Africa alone that are practicing FGC. And so um, just making sure that um, those are the communities at the moment that we're, we're working with, but we were open to any communities who come from, who, who come from those countries that are practicing as well. Um, so traditional African roles, women's traditional role is to be good mothers, carers. Um, pregnancy is really mostly women's business. Um, men don't get involved in, in, in that, in the aspect of, um, you know, when the woman is pregnant to, uh, you know, birth and after that. Um, women rally on female relatives, friends for support during this time. Um, there is a traditional practice that, um, you know, I mean, it's something that hospitals or services could be part of, which is um, some African women in the community do do like a 40 days after giving birth where women are, um, you know, they're at home and they're fed and they've been looked after, their baby's been taken care of. And um, there's education that happens on how to take care of the child and things like that within the post the 40 days. And they also give them, um, I guess, like a... a like a baby shower, but after the baby. <laughs> um, many African cultures um, are, are oral, so information is passed um, verbally.
traditional African communities. So um, health system in many African countries are inadequate. There is no context of um, uh, preventative health. So for example, just even like um, going and getting a cervical screen done is, is, is not something that is that's common to women. So women do need education, the importance of those things. Um, health education is very limited. Women experience um, barriers when accessing health system. Um, diff I said before this, um, different gender roles and expectation, um, poor health, literacy experiences, racism and discrimination. Things to consider when working with women is be very clear about your role, your scope, your authority, your responsibilities. Um, make appropriate referrals by knowing what this, what services there are available in your in the areas or the area that women are um, coming from, and what they can do for them. Be clear with women about what is happening. Ensure that they are informed at every stage um, of the way. Do not assume anything, as because FGC comes in many forms. Um, things to consider when working with women, use skilled female interpreters where possible, consult with FARAP services. So there are a lot of FARAP services within various areas, um, within hospital, within services, um, within clinics. There are FARAP services whom you can call and, and we can provide guidance here, I guess. Um, use welcoming manner and friendly body language, uh, maintain non-judgmental, respectful approach. Um, yeah. Have in the back of your mind um, countries where FGC is uh, more prevalent, but not don't generalize. Um, Somalia, for example, Somalia, Eritrea, Djibouti, um, North Sudan, commonly type threes practice. Egypt, Ethiopia, Mali, Sierra Leone, Middle East, Indian, India, ethics like type one and type two is mainly practice. Um, like I said before, Indonesia, um, where it's been medicalized, type one is medicalized. Um, I, I guess in a way to for harm reduction, there's um, there's always um, there will always be a women from areas of these countries which um, who will not be would not have had FGC. Therefore, you need to ask the question. And uh, one thing I want to add in there as well is that not a lot of women, um, especially because you know we were talking before about you know the age of FGC female genital cutting that's happening. Like some women don't actually know they've had it done or they've had, you know, um, because they they could have had it done when they just born. And so um, they would not know if they've been cut or they've been circumcised in any way. So um, it's really good to, to, to make sure that like these questions are, um, are, are asked and provided services for. Um, it could, this could be a question, this, like, you, this could be a way to, um, I guess, put the question is, um, like, you can say to women, um, many women from, say, for example, from Ethiopia, um, you know, they, they practice traditional cutting, is it something that you have experienced, um, explain that, um, that when examining her, um, it might be that it's difficult to perform the test or, the you know procedure and she, that she would need to be referred to uh, specialist clinics. Um, this is a link to a video that um Kohel did, which I think is really good to go through. Um, it really helps. It's a cartoon. It helps you guides you on how to ask the questions. So in your time, you can open the video and um you can send out that link as well with the video, if needed. It's really helpful. Yeah. How to support women, always use female interpreters on site, preferably if you can, but not always is possible, we know that. Um, we reassure, reassure women that um, the consultation is confidential and private. It might take more than one appointment to do that. Uh, let the women know that she can bring a friend, a relative to the appointment to help and support um, her. Use simple English language, um, use Diagrams, if you have to use flip charts, any appropriate website that you think will help explain um, and, you know, um, provide service to the women or the community.
Um, this is a case study. So um, the case studies I will share with you, this is a true story case study. So um, just name to change. Um, Kay is a 35-year-old. She just had her first baby in Australia. Her record shows that she had a vaginal birth and infibulation um, before labor. Kay is upset because her body feels very different and abnormal. She wants to be uh, reinfibulated and wants to find someone who can perform the procedure. Kay is very worried about how her menstrual and urinary patterns has changed. She also worried about her husband might feel she if she, um if she did not have a reinfibulation. She's worried that it might affect her relationship and that he might leave her and look for another wife. How might you support Kay in this situation? Um, so these are some of the tools you can use. So you can inform Kay about her the reasons, um, inform about the reasons the procedure was performed to deliver her baby. Um, invite her partner for consultation together. Like, you know, you can really even educate them about circumcision, inform both of them about the health implication of FGC. Sometimes um community, sometimes women don't link the implications of they don't really know what those implications are because there is no discussion of um, implication itself. So women don't, anything that happens during their pregnancy or birth or even prior to that during their marriage, um, whether, you know, um, when they're with their partner, you know, whether it's in, like there is no link of, imp there is no link between the implications of female genital cutting. Um, women don't, really know what those are because there is no discussion women don't talk to each other women um are not educated there is no enough like there is no resources out there that um that i mean they don't even access those resources i guess is what i'm saying is so women need to learn um and to be provided those resources those this information women need to be able to kind of acknowledge that they you know that because of like these are the reasons of why she she's experiencing these things um it's because of you know the, the practice that's been done it's what's been taken off or what's been in, performed that's impacting her birthing or her experience of sexual pleasure itself and so um so you know I guess yeah so being able to provide like step-by-step -step education about female genital cutting is is the first step to go both with partners and with with the women themselves um so inform them about why she she cannot be you know reinfibulated like there needs to be education around um the fgc laws in victoria the fgc laws in in australia um and from what i know that um doctors cannot reinfibulate a woman back um because that's against the law. That's performing female genital cutting. Um, that's performing FGM. So um, it is against the law. And so women need to be educated around that as well. Um, refer them to fire up services for further support. Um, there are various fire up services within hospitals, such as the women's, whom whom they can be referred to for various supports. Um, case study two, S is 29-year-old. Um, she just had her first baby girl you know, in Australia six months ago. She, um, S wants to know where she can take her daughter to circumcise her. How might you support S in this situation? Um, so I guess I'm um, asking the reasons of why she wants to circumcise her daughter um ask this to help you inform your response and what the you know what you're going to be doing inform her about fg fgc the implication the health consequences you know um inform her about the the laws in victoria um share your concerns with the parents both you know um the the partners um and the you know guardians document in your notes her intentions um monitor the child um if you're 
if if you do have if you are a maternal child health nurse for example um you do you do have access to a child up to four year old um there are ways you can you can monitor if any type of circumcision has been done to the child there are things that you can look for um yeah documenting your nurse intentions of and and monitoring consult with management if if you have if you have access to that um report it due to DHHS and but let the parents know that you've done the reporting as well like if you feel like this is going to be something that needs to be reported ASAP then child protection should be involved in that case um these are just some of um the FARP services out there so the women's the Royal Women's uh, Hospital does have um FARP workers within the hospital um they that's where women who are going through um prenatal and postnatal care and de fibrillation do have access to to those services in in the hospital um there are FARP workers however in various other um health setting or service settings um for example in Gen West like I said before we've got two FARP workers um women's health in the north in Tisar is is the other FARP worker. Um Co Health has got a couple of FARP workers in um Carlton and um in other parts, like Kensington, other parts of area as well. Um Monash Health has got some FARP workers. Derebin um Council Youth Services has another FARP worker, multicultural centre for women's health. Um Banyu Community Health, uh, Mercy Hospital for Women. Us, these are just some of the far where far workers um are working in. So these are just some of um I guess some of the links that you can um click on in if you want to hear more about um like with the World Health Organization they've got really um good data about um fact sheets and things like that around female genital cutting, the Better Health Channel um. Yeah, the RWH African Women's Clinic has got the women's has got really, really good resources in the fire up, part of the fire up services as well. And Core Health has a couple of video, couple of things in relation to fire up and the fire up program as well. Yeah, thank you for um giving us the the space and the opportunity to be part of um this. Um if yeah, I can I'll Send it back to Sarah, and then yeah, we'll go from there. Great, thank you so much, Shakria, and also a big thank you to Intasar. I have heard this presentation a couple of times, but I always learn something new from it, and I'm hoping that the attendees, I'm sure that they have learned lots from it as well. I'm going to give Shakria and Intasar a bit of um, a break from speaking before we do the Q&A and just want to run through a few of the health pathway slides that are relevant to FGC. Um, as GPs, I'm sure that you're all very familiar with um, health pathways and the website. I just want to run through a few slides that show the referral pathways for female genital cutting in particular. Thank you, Tilly. So the process of developing content for the health pathways is a collaborative effort between local GPs, specialists, allied health providers and subject matter experts. Each of the pathways is um, reflecting the local context um, and it's basically there to enhance your clinical knowledge and promote best practice. It also helps reduce variation in care and will give you some clear indications on the referral pathways for your patients. I'm just going to run through the slides, but when we do share these slides um, via email, there'll be a link um, to the referral pathway and you'll be able to click through these yourselves. Um, I know it's a little bit odd for me to just sort of have screenshots of the website and it's a bit harder to follow than clicking through yourself but I think these will be helpful guides so that you know exactly where to click on to. Um, thanks Tilly. 
So when you click onto the female genital cutting slash mutilation um, heading on the website, it'll take you through to this, which will give you a bit of information about the practice um, and also some suggestions on identifying this with your patients as well. There's also um, some information which was um, shared by Shakriya about um, some best practice assessment using interpretive services, understanding the cultural challenges before meeting with your patient, and also understanding the long-term implications of the key aspects to this. There's also a bit of information in there about management and referral and some um, information there as well about mandatory reporting, which we can also talk to more in the Q&A. Um, and then also some other referrals to other health um, practitioners. And then there's also just a bit more information for further reading. There's some links there to CoHealth. Um, the video that Shakri was referring to, I've popped the link into the chat. And then um, there's also some information from Sexual Health Victoria, formerly known as Family Planning Victoria, with some um, healthcare information there, as well as resources which are available on the Royal Women's website. All right, and um, if you aren't um, linked in with Health Pathways, there will be a QR code um, to register when we send out the slides. All right, great. So we'll go into question time um, and we'll welcome Joanne. So Joanne um, is a GP who works at CoHealth in Collingwood um, and also works at Long Head to Health and is a refugee health fellow at Royal Melbourne Hospital. And Joanne has been working with refugees and asylum seekers since 1995. So we have a lot of expertise um, across Strictly into Sarah and Joanne to answer your questions. And I've noticed that there are some in the Q&A um, chat box as well as in the chat. So if you do have anything else to add while we go through those first, please pop them in. Um, we're ahead of schedule as well, so we do have plenty of time to answer some questions. I'm going to just start with the one that's in the Q&A first, and I'll, I'll put that across to any three of you to answer. So um, it was regarding the first case study, and I might just read that out so that I can refresh everyone's memory. So Kay is a 35-year-old who's just had her first baby in Australia. She's had a vaginal birth and defibrillation before labour, However, she's upset because her body feels different and abnormal. She'd like to be refibrillated and wants to find someone who can perform the procedure. She's worried about her menstrual and urinary pattern and how that has changed. And she's also concerned that her husband might feel she did not have a refibrillation. She's worried that this might affect their relationship and that he might leave her to look for another wife. So the question that we have there is regarding the first case, can K select to have a CS rather than defibrillation to give birth? Um, my goodness, I don't know whether Intisar or Shukriya would like to tackle that one. Okay. I feel at a distinct disadvantage not being a gynecologist or an obstetrician. Um, hmm. And I think it begs the question that there was clearly not a lot of information perhaps given to Kay in her interaction with the hospital or when she was uh, giving birth, um, which leads her, puts her in this belly parlour situation. I think that that's obviously why this situation has arisen. And to be honest, people not being given a lot of information about what happened to them in the hospital, particularly when English is a second language, is more far more common than not um i had a gentleman who came to see me the other day who was of ethiopian background and he didn't understand that his gallbladder had been taken out because he'd had acute cholecystitis so i had to explain everything to him 
you with the help of Google and diagrams. Um, so this doesn't surprise me at all. I think that um, uh, I would not like to be the obstetrician who decided that somebody should risk a Caesar rather than having uh, de-infibulation. Um, but that would be a conversation to be had with the woman. And ideally, you would have a conversation with Kay when you had diagnosed, when you had worked out that she was pregnant and you were doing the antenatal screening or you were having a conversation with her even earlier about um, what CST is in cervical screening is in Australia. Um, you would have a conversation um, that would become part of, normally part of um, looking after her gynecological health as you would with any woman. And you would include this question very casually and gently as part of that that question, knowing that Kay was from a country where uh, FGC is of high prevalence. Um, the other thing to say about asking the question, and I think that um, Intasar and Shukriya have made the point extremely clearly, that it's really important that you work with a female interpreter and that you allow adequate time and that you don't necessarily try to complete the gynae education or gynae exam in one session and that you um where you can have a trusted female relative or friend with her or um enable uh a situation where you can ask the question perhaps without her her husband present if that might be more acceptable i've often found when a man comes in to interpret for his wife um, you know, often trying to do the best that he can to ensure that, you know, things are done properly for his beloved wife. Sometimes um, I will offer an interpreter and if I say something like, we'll be discussing women's business and I have a trained female interpreter and I mention women's business, the man gets a fright and runs out of the room because he doesn't want to discuss blood and horrible things that might be pertaining. So um, that's often a way I deal with it. But I'm interested to see what Intasar and Shukriya have to say about this case. Um, I'm really I'm with you, um, Joanne. Um, but one of one of the issue in in hospital, especially um, you know, prior to birth, like during pregnancy, um, is the power of decision is being taken away um from women um, and because. English being her second language, but being, I guess, decisions around her her sexual reproductive health, her health and well being, her um, birth experience, those all those things have been taken away. Um, I've experienced that personally, where decisions have been made for me um, without, I guess, evidence of um, without evidence being given to me to say this is the reasons why we what to do this and these are the evidence why this needs to be done so and I've assumed um you know, you know those people were making those decisions where they were making decisions for my health and and, and well-being so um but you know I faced the consequences of it later on um after my my birth um and so um a lot of women especially newly arrived women um these are the really one of the like the biggest issue that they face is is that um that they the decisions are not given to them around the infibulation around um whether you know the choice of c section th that space is not um is is being informed or there is, there is no system mm -hmm. um in place to 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 give that um yeah mm -hmm. i don't know if I've, I've answered it yeah no that's I, I did, yeah, you're quite right. And um, I think that there is a bit of a tendency to try to avoid caesarean section wherever possible. But it, you're right that the decision perhaps isn't given to the woman in this situation where it could be quite critical for her mental well-being. Yeah. I just want to add to that, um, to Joanne and Shabuya. I think you answered it perfectly, but... It's if you asking her to do a Caesar session, I think you add in another layer, you know, and concern on her because in our community, when you have your um your kids by Caesar or labor, like you know, a, um first with labor is it, with Caesar session is a huge thing. It's like it's not a good thing. So they they want to have their children normal or babies deliver normal. 
So that is going to be another concern, another um, stress for her when you ask her that question. But it comes from her. If it comes from her and say, hey, um, I'm going to find it hard to have, um, you know, uh, my baby through my vagina. So I need a scissor session. That's fine. But I don't think it would be a good idea to come from the um, the doctor itself or the practitioner. And if the question is asked, when when K is being referred to the, if the question is asked by the GP and then the GP is doing the referral to the, e.g. the Royal Women's or the Mercy, then um, the GP can actually put the women's choice or the fact that this conversation has occurred in the referral. So and the have the conversation. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, like, for example, there isn't, I've been talking about counselling lately, um, there isn't proper pathways um, for, for women, even if, it, like, this person is going through this emotional experience, this traumatic, it, it is a traumatic thing, you know, um, being being infibulated for so long um, and, and now being infibulated, you know, getting used to all that, like, that that really impacts her, her 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 mental health and well being, and there is no specific um, service or link. Like there isn't any counselling, um, like proper counselling, proper environment where women can be, yeah. you know, supported. I guess in 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 step by step guided on where to access those things. Yeah, and that's not long ago. I guess it's a longer story, but we're gonna make make it short. Mm. So um, there was a lady who came from Somalia, and that's a true story that we heard from the Royal Woman Hospital. So um, she was a young girl, get married. They brought, her husband brought her here. She was type 3, and that's only two years or three years ago. And um, type 3, she went to the Gibi. Um, the Gibi, um, I think, referred her to um, another, to um, a private practitioner. And then the private practitioner examined her, and found that she's type three, and they said they have to pay four thousand dollars to do the restitch because that's because the GB at the beginning he gave her um, a relaxing tablet because it felt like it's hard. She came to him with it's hard to do intercourse with my husband, you know. So they gave her they start with relaxing tablets without even examining him, and then she come two weeks later. Um, you refer her to a private practitioner. The private practitioner told her she has to pay 4000 where at the Royal Woman Hospital, there's a free service to do the re -infibulation. So um, I think there's misinformation going on. So those women need information and, you know, need guiding and need um, a good pathway to find the right service. Thanks so much, everyone. I'm going to keep us moving along because we have had another seven questions come through the Q&A and I want to hopefully be able to answer them all. Um, so the next question is, in Australia, a procedure such as labiaplasty or clitoral piercing considered FGC, FGM. Are they illegal here? And if not, why is this treated differently? I'll pass that over to you. Um. So it, it is illegal for for women who migrate from FGC communities. It is definitely illegal. So if I can't get lapoplasia, whereas Sarah, you can get lapoplasia. So that's from what I know in in legal the legal status of it. That's what lapoplasia legality is. Um, is that uh, because I come from the community where FGC is practiced or from countries where it's practiced. So I cannot, it is a form of type 1 um, FGC, so I can't get lapoplasia. But if Sarah goes, Sarah can get lapoplasia done. I hope that answers the question. So yes, I guess the answer is not a very fair system at the moment and something that definitely needs to be looked into. All right, I'll move us on to the next question. Um, so one of the slides mentioned that FGC, FGM is sometimes carried out during first pregnancy. Why is this a time that FGM would occur?
can you yeah. uh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, so it's saying that one of the slides mentioned that FGM is sometimes carried out during first pregnancy. Carry out? I think so. Yep. yep. And so the person is asking, Chiara is asking, why is this a time that FGC would happen? Um, in some cultures, um, it's just a cultural custom um, that um, the it, it's um, – there's a myth around the clitoris touching the heads of the baby and harming or killing the heads of the baby. And so it's a custom that um, in some cultures um, women get um, the, the clitoris and parts of the, um, the external um, labias are cut. Thanks, Sabrina. The next question, so from Sue, um, it said it was mentioned that Indonesia and Malaysia are large, largely in relation to harm minimization approach. What is the general pattern across these and other countries in Asia? And this question is being asked in relation to the general awareness for practitioners to know whether the practice, whether to reference the practice and how to start the discussion. So do you want me to repeat the question or? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I think the question essentially is asking, what is the general pattern across Indonesia, Malaysia and other countries in Asia? Um, just to help GPs know where, when or where to, to start the conversation. Look, from what I know um, in Indonesia, like I, I don't know a lot of other Asian countries, um, but from from what I know, I mean, Indonesia is, is used as the way of harm reduction, um, especially like, so there is a pricking of the clitoris to let the blood out. There's an assumption that that blood is somehow dirty. Um, and there is an assumption in, 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 rela in relation to Islam and around the prophet. Um, there's a myth. And so um, there, and so they want to fulfill, I guess, the community's need around that. And so that is being done within hospitals is, is what's happening at the moment. Um, so we, we don't really know much in, in relation to um, like the records or data and things like that from, from those countries um, at the moment. And um, so... I guess we don't really have um, answers, and the only I, I guess advice I I would give is that um, is like I said, like Intasar said before, in, in relations to Victoria and the estimates in Victoria or also Australia, whether there's migration, whether kids are being taken to Indonesia and in other parts of the world to get circumcised. We don't know. We don't know anything. What what this is the one of the reasons that we're doing work like this is to educate service providers, to educate those who are in the forefront of, you know, supporting families, supporting little children, is making sure that they are well-educated on what they're looking for and what needs to happen, you know, if, for example, with child protection or GPs, knowing exactly if, if you know, when the child comes in for checkups and things like that, knowing if that circumcision has taken place or not, because... Um, we don't know if kids have been taken to Malaysia or Indonesia in, in, in those countries and circumcised and brought back here. Um, and, yeah, I don't know how else I'll to answer that question. Thanks, Rick. I think that provides... Could I, could, I, could I follow that one up? I have a lot of families that are now travelling back to visit friends and relatives in their country of origin. And um, I I often... I, I don't have a, you know, we talk about their immunizations, we talk about avoiding diarrhea and taking their malaria tablets. I don't certainly have any patter developed to ask whether or not they're planning to get their little girl uh, uh, have the cutting. Um, and I think it, uh, I don't know if there are any um, notifications to child protection. Do we have any? Do we have any evidence about um, about that sort of thing? Because uh, it would be interesting if there was. Uh, it would be interesting if that because I don't know if that um, you know children aren't don't seem to be coming in perhaps with um, 
problems associated at the moment. I wonder if we would know about that or if the Royal Children's would know about that, for example. So I guess another point there about the need for some clearer data collection. Yeah. Okay. Like we really don't have the capacity or the ability to do a lot of work around this work because we're not like uh, we're very funded. This like our funding is not enough to do the kind of work we would wish and we want to do. I was just thinking the immigrant child health clinics at the Royal Children's Hospital. Um they're a fantastic team and they see a lot of their main work is with um, refugees and asylum seekers and the children born in Australia of uh, people who come as humanitarian entrants and migrants often. And um, of all the things they've covered, I'm not sure that this has been touched on. So I'm going to um, check in with that team and see if they've got any feedback that might be helpful. Definitely. Okay, I'll, I'll, are we ready to move on to the next question? Anyone have anything to add? All right. So the next question from Wei Cheng is asking, what is the legal standing for GPs for existing FGC? Is there anything except to say that no FGC, like no new FGC is allowed to take place? I think I think legally we have to say that no new FGC is allowed to take place. And there's a question from Alice um, that if a little girl's brought back from their country of origin after where cutting can be clearly demonstrated, yes, I think you'd be obliged to report that. That would be my impression. Yeah, yeah you're mandated. Yeah. Right, so just to clarify in response to Alice's question that if someone was um, traveling back from their country of origin and they had FGC in that country of origin, then the health professional is mandated to report that. Yeah. Having having said, have, discussing this though, I have to say I've looked after many people from, um, in, from these high prevalence countries and I've looked after many people who've traveled back, including with their children. I've never heard of this happening, I have to say. All right. Our next question is from Kiara. It's saying, it's asking if anyone knows if there's any idea about how often reports are being made to child protection. I think this actually goes back to what we just discussed, that um, there isn't any insight to that um, because the data collection isn't there. Um, so some more funding on doing that work would be fabulous. Um, just making sure that I'm answering the second part of that question as well, Kiara. So what has FARAP's experience has been when reports of this kind have been made? Have child protection responded appropriately and known how to support the family and safeguard the child? I mean, I haven't, look, I haven't come across, uh, like, in relation to child protection or, like, in relation to any FGC in to a child um i don't think um the things are being implemented to even see if that child is being circumcised or not like what's been happening the only time a record or evidence is seen is when there is a complication of fgc so any type of complication that takes place then you know the child we would be seeing um with the jp or the child um, discloses that to um, a service provider or, a, a, you know, a child protection. In relations to disclosures, we haven't come across any, we haven't heard any. Um, we've been trying to do work, um, like, for example, myself, I've been trying to do work with child protection around how to support them in asking questions, in, in, in supporting, in being able to support um, disclosures if there are any, um, when they are meeting with, you know, um, in, in, when they are faced within those environments or the, within those sets of environments, but I haven't, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, but it was nationally, was in TV, but I haven't come across uh, like case with um, cat protection and stuff. I mean, serious, serious complications, I would think, would end up at the Royal Children's. No. Yeah. Under the gynae clinic at the Royal Children's. That's where I think that they would likely end up if they were if they were that serious and mm -hmm. then yeah. So that that would be a that would be the first trail to follow if you're trying yeah. to do research. Yeah. As yeah. as with far worker, we're not we're not allowed to report it as well as yeah. far work is. Yeah. So we're not mandated to report. Yeah. That's a good point. If just that, besides farm workers, is there anyone else that isn't mandated to report? Um, I, I think like health, health practitioners, like doctors, GPs, um, like nurses. Um, like there are people who are mandated to report. Um, but yeah, yeah. Are you saying besides? them or yes well is there anyone that isn't mandated so i'm just sort of wanting to get some clarity so as a farab worker no i think everyone that work with children they yeah. are mandated be, to yeah. report it a part of farab workers okay yeah. all right like teachers everyone like yeah in, um has to yeah i don't know i don't even like you know who not to be reported i think everyone needs to report it if you work in this child yeah. And come across circumcision. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have another question here about whether or not there's been any known convictions in Victoria. Um, I know Shakira, we have had a conversation about convictions in Western Australia. Yeah. Um, but yeah, did, did anyone want to speak to that or talk about any known convictions in Victoria? Mm -hmm. Um, in Dandenong was one but then I don't know what happened <laughs> like a few years ago talked about it for a little bit and then I don't know what happened it disappeared mm -hmm. so we, we know that in Western Australia a couple of months back well a year ago um there were two women um who who asked the question around sex of Decision space. So the women asked the question around um, where she, she can take her child to get circumcised. And um, that was taken um, out of context, I guess. And there were two women who were convicted for about 15 years imprisonment um, for asking the GP um, those questions. Um, and police and other um, government po people were involved in, in those cases. I was really, it really got to me. Um, because you know, like if if the child was circumcised for sure, that that should have been the path that should have been taken. Um, but these are newly arrived women who are asking questions and who have been put in um, in a, in this you know end of the environment, and and it really saddens me on what's happening, what the legalities, what the law, what what's what's going on in Western Australia, and and stuff around that. Um, and that that's creating a lot of um chaos in the community um mm. around being able to even open and be you know be able to to open up to other community services to people like us who are, you know are trying to support and provide uh, mm. advocacy work and be able to advocate for them and and the, their health and well-being and for them to be able to access those services mm. It, it occurs to me, too, that the um, AIMS provides English as a second language education for newly arrived migrants and humanitarian entrants. And I know that they have a health module. I wonder if FARAP has ever been invited to present some of this material as part of the AIMS health module where you would have a ready-made um, audience who would uh, at least be alerted to the fact that they could go somewhere to find out a bit more about this information um so one of the the thing when we're doing um health promotion or doing you know sexual and reproductive health education around female genital cutting is that um we we have a module that we we need to work on um we can't directly just be providing a, a you know fgc session we want women to be able to feel really comfortable and be able to um 
have the safe space to to disclose, you know, or be able to be supported and linked into services and things like that. Um, and in the past, we've had few fundings here and there, and I've done really good work with women in the community or even with with aints um as well. But we, yeah, we 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 can't we can't do those things because we're not uh because of our like limited fundings. It's really hard to do those things. All right. Um, a follow up question here from Wei Cheng saying, does the nationality of the child make any difference when it comes regarding compulsory differences? So, for example, what child protection is going to do when it is reported parents are going to take their non-Australian citizen to their home country for circumcision? So does nationality have a fa factor in to the response? Does anyone know? that happens like in what sense um, if the person if the child is being yeah. taken home to get circumcised because yes so if that child is an Australian citizen for example nationality wise they are Australian um which I'm not sure if you'd like to clarify from what I'm understanding of that question I think it's saying if it's a non-Australian citizen that is child that is going back to their um, country of origin, does child protection take into consideration the child's nationality? So, for example, if you're um, a permanent resident or you're on a humanitarian visa but you still have EG, an Egyptian passport, or uh, EG, a Mali passport, would that be the question perhaps? And then does does uh, child protection have um, have any authority over someone who is not an Australian citizen? Quote unquote. I would have thought that I would have thought that they would have had authority over a child for for child protection, a child resident in Australia. But anyway, Intasar and Shakria might know. I have no idea. <laughs> That's a really good question for child protection. Yeah. We have someone in the chat saying child protection can certainly become involved with those cases. Yeah. It's more complex, but if risk is there, then applications can be made for protection. Yeah. Great. All right. Um, scrolling up, I know that Sue had a question um, regarding whether or not help is available to support practitioners have the conversations around FTC and um, pre and postnatal care or anything related to FTC with the partners as well. Does that have what? Is, is there support available for practitioners to have conversations of FTC with their patients, but with their partners as well? So with the patient's partner. Yeah, I mean, like we're we're ferret workers. We we do provide secondary consultation. Um, you can give us a call. Um, we can guide you step by step on how to even ask the question and what kind of resources um are really good to be given to women. Um, even if you you know you want something, for example, to guide you on what diagrams to use, what diagrams to avoid to use, those things. Like we we can guide and and do that. Um, you can refer those if you know you can refer the refer those women as well to the women's hospital who, who do have a couple of fat workers who can provide those those resources uh, as well whether to you to to the you know the, to the practitioners or to um to the women. I, yeah, think I just want to add to that as well like. It's, it's also kind of a family and you can invite the fire workers as well if you want us to be in that meeting. So the partner, the woman and us, or um, we can provide you with um, resources, how to talk to the partner as well. Is, is a lot of work being done with, um, with partners and with male members of these high prevalence communities? Mm. Yes. Um, so CoHealth has a male worker a male FARC worker who's doing work. 
um, with men in the community around educating young men around um, the importance of um, FGC but other sexual reproductive health and and how to support their women in you know um, and and educate them about you know the roles of men um, you know the roles of men in decision making about what happens to the you know to the child um, and those things um, but like I said. We only have one man, <laughs> um, and there isn't um, there isn't a lot of work happening with men because we don't have enough. Yeah. <laughs> so and, and we were keep hearing from him that the men saying this is not our problems. <laughs> you know, you don't talk to us about this. You know, we've got a lot to care about or to worry about. Why are we talking? Why are you talking to us about circumcision? So, but. Um, in the other hand, circumcision happening most of the time for them as well. It's because they want to make the husband happy. They wanted the vegan attack. They, you know, all those stuff. It's happening for them, but the woman taking care of it. So, um, yeah. So it's a broad conversation to be had with the men <laughs> in the community. It's not just, mm. yeah. There's a lot of work definitely that needs to happen. Um, hopefully one day there is and we'll do and be able to do that. Um, but at the moment, yeah. Okay. All right. I am going to um ask a question which um was sent through earlier. So um Sorry, let me just find where these went. All right, so this is a question to or for Joanne, although there is definitely um, insights from Shakria and Intisa. Um, so the question is that FGC and its implications may not be the reason a person is coming to seek health care, so it may not be an appropriate time to talk about FGC. In your experience, Joanne, when is a good time to inquire about female genital cutting? All right, that's a really good question. Um, I think in my, yes, so I I think that um, there are a few a few really obvious occasions. First, if you're doing um, a refugee health assessment and you're talking to the woman on her own, and if you've established rapport, and as most of us would know, we don't have to do a refugee health assessment all in one go. We could see the person or the family over several visits and establish rapport. But as part of the inquiry into gynecological health, sexual health, sexual safety, that one might very gently ask about with a female interpreter in a one-to-one -one situation, um, one of the questions might be um, uh, when you're inquiring about pregnancy, previous labour, delivery, children, about if the woman has had the traditional cutting and if she's had any problems as a result of that. So that's the first time. The now the time might be um, any time that pregnancy is being planned or um, a cervical screening test plus or minus breast examination is being discussed. So those are very obvious times. Or if the person presents to you for the first time in your um diagnosing pregnancy um that might be a time to inquire as well um so those i think are logical times to talk about it i think springing the question out of the blue to someone that you don't know very well um without a female interpreter without a rapport it's not going to go down particularly well so it's really important to um choose your time and choose your context as you would do for anything as a sensible gp um, but colleagues, what do you think? Into Sasha Kriya, what would you add? Yeah, yeah I think that's how uh, you answer it, Well, In addition to, I was just, um, the story that I said, if there's a young woman came to you and said, uh, hi, um, you know, I can't do um, intercourse or I find it hard to um, yeah, do intercourse for something on my club or yeah. So that would be a you know, good time to examine the young lady. And I think like just you know, yeah, like when you're getting because um 
you know, it's funny, like we, we say family doctor, like your family doctor knows you inside out. Um, and it, 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 like, it would be really like my perfect family doctor would be someone who would be able to kind of um, know everything about, you know, I mean, it's, it's not a question that needs to be asked ASAP, but knowing my background, you know, just knowing like those roots, those, those, those cultures that I come from, the, you know, the, the environment that I grew up in and being able to have that understanding and, and, um, you know, not having um, discrimination around what I could have had or, you know, things like that. But yeah, being able to kind of, um, I guess provide specific support of like that covers my needs um mm -hmm. and like that would make me want to go to that GP every day you know if I have to um but creating a safe environment um and you know and and because as soon as you do that as soon as you create a safe environment I'm telling you disclosures about everything happens then yeah can I, can I, I just had another thought about um, this as well. The first is that now there is a, ten, a trend for um, um, cervical screening done by the woman herself using um, uh, using the uh, the swab um, and also the uh, the swab that is done at 36 weeks of pregnancy for um, uh, GBS. Just to remind people that women from, as, 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 as Intisar and Shukriya have so eloquently explained, the health literacy may be very poor and it may be very difficult for women to um to to put the swab in and they may need assistance they may need diagrams they may need um help the other thing too though that as women are doing putting the swab in themselves you don't necessarily get to examine them very well um um so it's important if you if you do feel experienced enough to do cst using a speculum on a client in this situation um it is possible with time and gentleness and patience and using a very, very tiny speculum. I've been able to do many painless, um, relatively painless pap smears in this situation. The other thing to be aware of too, that situation about to be examined with a speculum, um, even if you're using a very gentle and very careful approach, a woman can have a flashback both to sexual assault and also to... Um, traditional cutting I've had women suddenly who were quite keen to have a pap smear and were chatting away all of a sudden as I approach with the speculum all of a sudden having a horrible flashback and screaming and sitting up and and so just be aware that um, uh, for some women they can be very traumatized and can be triggered or not even realize that they've been traumatized and be triggered by this so just always being aware of that being very patient and always taking things very gently at the at the client's pace is really important. Those are really important points, Joanne. Thank you for raising that. Shakira and Intisar, do you have anything that you wanted to add about the cervical screening? Any important things to consider? Um, I, I really, look, I really like the idea of self-test. Um, but I, I, I also do um, just make sure, you know, with um, because we've I've had a lot of disclosures around cervical screen, um, past cervical screens, and especially with women who've had type three, um, and and the the stuff that happened through that as well, um, so I guess yeah, um, I guess priority, you know, um giving them the, the the choices for them to make and 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 explaining to them step by step on like what they need to do where they it needs to and that it's not sometimes like women want you know during pregnancy would not want to have test because there is this assumption that they might touch the baby's head or something like that and so explaining and, and and making sure, you know, if, even that explaining could be with a diagram, anything like that, just making sure that, they, you know, that there is an understanding that nothing's going to happen and this is just a procedure that needs to be done and it's safe. So just, you know, creating that safe environment for her to be able to do those things. Okay, thank you. 
All right, I think we might move on to our final question. And what I would like to ask is for each of you to share with the GPs who are in attendance tonight, um, three key things that you would like for them to take away and to incorporate into their practice after this session. I shared with Joanne before. <laughs> yeah, my three points, Joanne. <laughs> we'll get you to share them, Shakriya, so that all the other GPs in the room are also Over to Shakriya. Um, I, they're my wish list, but um, yeah, I I really um ask question um like just making sure that you know um you know where those women are come, you know they are from those communities. If if you just ask, be able to ask the question because I think asking the question would help um implement what happens after that, what needs to happen um and make sure um. There's a lot of discrimination. Um, there's a lot of um, assumptions um, that that happened, and, and and I want, you know, like those things put aside around, you know, the cultures or the the religion or whatever that those community or those women are from. That those are, you know, like remove those things away um create a safe space for women to be able to disclose um and be able to have you know a safe space um for those things to happen you know for for women to be able to feel empowered to make her own decision around her sexual reproductive give the women the ability to make those decisions themselves um yeah I don't know if I'm making sense <laughs> um just remember you could be like you know the important point for the woman um um so that you, you might be the first point as well um you might be the hop because people when they come from um, like those are like our countries or Africa, they come in here to have quality life. So make sure that they're not having, um, um, they're not feeling like they are, the circumstances, uh, there's, um, what do you call it? Racism. <laughs> Just lost it. So don't make feel, make them feel that it's um, racism or I don't, I think like, you know, um, practitioner don't mean it but the woman feel that way the way they explaining the way that they're giving the information the way they asking the way that they talking about the issue you know you might not uh, mean it but we just need to be very careful not to be judgmental um not uh, you know ask a critical question like you know a question that they can answer um like why why that's happened to you she's not going to answer that question so we need to go forward like what we want to do with this um the other thing is it's a very sensitive issue by the way it's very i want to take this it's a very sensitive issue you don't talk about it with your community you don't talk about it with your family you don't talk about it with your friends so the only one that i talk about it with is you as a practitioner because they need to otherwise they might not talk about it um, so they don't talk about it at least if they need to. Um, yeah, I guess um, try to use um, a professional interpreter, no husband, no kids, no, you know, no one. So we need, you need to be um, in dots, like, no, I need to use a professional um, interpreter. But there's a lot of things that I want you to take, <laughs> but I will stop here. Um, thank you so much. And my three very quickly, ask the question. And as everyone has said, use an interpreter and do it, provide safety, cultural safety. Number two, don't be judgmental. Don't do what I did the first time and burst into tears when a woman told me that she had had the uh, cutting that was very inappropriate and she ended up patting my hand. That was the <laughs> I, won't, I never did that again. That was only the first time. The third thing, know your referral pathways. FARAP and the Royal Women's Hospital and use your resources. That's it for me. And I just want to add in 
it's a cultural custom that needs to be eradicated. I'm going to say this. It's a cultural custom that needs to go away <laughs> and that women need to be given the power to make decisions around their sexual and reproductive health. Women need to be, you know, advocated for. And, and so, it, yeah. Definitely. Thank you, everyone, for some really excellent points there. Um, we will be sharing resources and um, contacts for referral pathways along with the presentation slides. We're really hoping that everyone can stay on for another five minutes. We just want to do um, a brief evaluation to find out from you what future sessions could look like, what kind of content, what kind of information and support you need as health practitioners to make the changes that are required around your FGC practice with your patients. So if you could please um, go to menti.com if you have your phones handy um, or you can open up a new window and go to menti.com and the code to enter is in the chat. The code is 49546153. And we have our first question of three. Um, so we will be brief, but um, we just want to get an understanding of whether or not your knowledge of female genital cutting has changed after participating in this session. So if you could please stay on for a few moments, just pop your responses to these questions, that would be really appreciated. Yes, so the number, again, the code to enter in is So if you go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I dot C-O-M, and the code to enter in is 49546153. And Tilly has also placed that code into the chat. Is that working for everyone? Are you able to see that first question? No option to answer. Okay, and also not able to answer the code. Um, all right. Let's move. Is there anyone able to see the second question now? We've just moved on to the next question. We can go back um, and you can just write into the chat if your knowledge of it, female genital cutting has changed following the um session but are you able to answer enter a response now for this second question will you make any changes to your practice after participating in this session and if so how
it looks like we might have some Mentimeter issues. Apologies. Um, it would be really fabulous if um, people could answer the responses in the chat. Um, so just giving us a sense of whether or not your knowledge of female genital cutting has changed from this session and if there are changes that you will make to your practice. We'd also really love to know what else you would like to know about female genital cutting and also the FARAP program. If there was another one of these sessions held or if there was information that was emailed to you, what kind of information would you like to know? Right. And so what we'll do is um, Shakriya, Intasar, Joanne, Tilly and I will read through your responses in the chat and that will help us inform what future sessions we develop and also what to include in the resource and follow-up email that we send through. We'll hopefully be able to provide a bit more information and support you in making some changes to the practice that you're doing or at least to support the practice that you're currently doing um, if you're feeling confident with that. The other thing that you will have noticed is that a link will have come through in the chat from the Northwest Metro PHN. Um, it'd be great if you could take the time to fill that out. There's a QR code on the screen and there's also a link when we send through the slides Yeah, it's really great to read all of the different topics that you'd like further information on. Um, and we'll, we'll make note of that. Right. Well, we'll leave that link up um, for a little while just so that everyone has time to um, copy it down or to scan their phones and the QR code. Uh, but I, I just really want to say a big thank you to everyone, all the attendees who came along to the session. A huge thank you to the PHN for supporting um, this work and particularly to Shakriya and Intasar for all of the hard work and for sharing your lived experience and also your professional experience this evening and thank you as well to Joanne for coming along and sharing your experience in working with this space as well. Right, great well um oh yes um I also just saw a pop-up in the chat of contact details so um Joanne, are you happy for your email to be shared around to attendees today? Okay, perfect. 
we will make sure to include that in the follow-up email as well. Awesome. Well, I hope everyone has a lovely evening um, and we'll speak to you soon.